It's time for your daily LSU baseball update with Musso at the box. Now, Matt Musso. And welcome into another edition of Musso at the box. Tigers eight days away from opening up the 2024 season. Title defense of, uh, of number seven, just eight days away. Of course, they'll play host to VMI at the box for a 2 p.m. first pitch. And a round robin that weekend, obviously, you'll have uh, two games against VMI. They'll play Friday through Monday. Two games against VMI, on Friday, one on Friday, one on Sunday. And then they will play Central Arkansas uh, the other two days on on uh, on Saturday and then on Monday. Tigers played Central Arkansas last year in a midweek game, uh, dispatched of them uh, fairly fairly easily uh, in the in the pre conference. I believe it was the pre conference slate. It might have been it might have been in between an SEC series. I'm not quite sure. This headset is driving me Hulk. Oh, crazy. Hold on one second. Okay. Hopefully that's the end of that. That was really. Really unfortunate. All right, so here we go. On today's show, what we're getting into is we got to finish the listener Q&A. Y'all send in so many questions, we couldn't really get through all of them in yesterday's show. So we got a, a little less than half of them left to go through today, and that'll probably take just about uh, our entire time. So that's what we will do on today's show. Excited to get back in into that conversation because it was it was really good conversation yesterday. First, though, of course, I'll remind you, get to the YouTube channel, subscribe up. Not hard to notice if, if you're watching right now or if you've listened to the show. I mean, we have added a video element this year, so go to YouTube, Muso at the box, type that in, channel will pop right up, hit subscribe, hit the bell, you'll get notified each time an episode drops, dropping them at 6 a.m. this year. If there's a day that they won't drop then, it might be a little later, I will obviously inform you, but get to the YouTube channel, subscribe up, man. We're, we're pushing 400 subscribers already right now. The channel's been live for about a week now. I think it went live last Thursday, so... That's I mean we're, that's that's good, but we want to keep on going, get the thing up to a thousand and and higher. So anything you can do to help is greatly appreciated. Subscribe, share, like, all those things at the at the YouTube channel, and then of course, of course, you can find me anywhere where you get your podcast audio wise, right? Apple, Spotify, Google, anywhere you get your podcast. Moose with the box is there. Like it, subscribe, share it out uh, on the, on those platforms as well, and follow me on Twitter at Muso Matthew. All right. Let's dive right back into it, shall we? Listener questions. So just to refresh, if you didn't don't know how this works, this is year five that we're doing the show. And every year we've done like a, a preseason Q&A. Wanted to do it this week. Uh, and I normally just put out a call on, on Twitter or other social medias for questions. And y'all send them in and we answer them. And that's what happened this year. And, and plenty of them came in. So here's here's where we'll start right here. Uh, Matt Matt, at Matt Plavidal on Twitter sent in realistic realistic expectations for 2024 record wise and postseason. Okay, um, so next week as part of game week, we will go through the schedule totally, and I will give a record an official record prediction, and we'll talk plenty about the the road they have because y'all the road LSU has this year in conference play is. Brutal. I mean, it's it's pretty significant. Um, you 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 catch just about everybody from the SEC East this year. That is somebody, and and that's it's it's going to be a significant test for them in, in that realm because then you also add in the SEC West, which has traditionally been the stronger division in the last year of divisions in the league, as a matter of fact, but has uh, you know traditionally been the, the stronger division of the league at least as of late. But I mean, you look at you look at the. Um, uh, you know, Ole Miss maybe taking a little bit of a step back since winning the national championship. Mississippi State obviously taking a step back since winning the national championship. It's really Arkansas and LSU's division there in the East that's kind of taken on that uh, that stronghold. When you look at the pre-conference, you have two series that really stick out. You have to go to Houston to to do the uh, the Astros Foundation Classic, is what it's called now. Uh, and your first game there is Texas. That'll be a ranked on ranked matchup. Prime time, 7 o'clock on a Friday night in Minute Maid Park. It's going to be electric. The last time those two teams played in this event uh, was two years ago when LSU was there, and there was over 24,000 people in Minute Maid Park for that game. It was it was awesome. Now, LSU took it on the chin, but a great atmosphere that night for college baseball. It's something I will never forget. I mean, it was an Omaha atmosphere in March, and it, actually, I think that was in February, and it was... It, it was awesome. So that's obviously a big pre-conference game. And then the series against Xavier. Look, I'll be honest. I have not I have not 
you know, deep dived into or uh, dived deep, I should say, into Xavier yet because that series is not until March. But that was a tournament team last year that went to a regional final, and they're on your schedule. So I, that at least gets your attention. After that, though, LSU should kind of they should go through their non their pre conference slate with with relative ease. You'll start on the road at Mississippi State. That you know, I, I don't expect State to be as bad as they were last year. I expect them to be better. Of course, I said that going into last season too. Um, but still, going to Starkville never easy. And Mississippi State was not good last year, and you lost that series at home. So you can't take that lightly. And then the gauntlet starts for LSU, right? You're at home against Florida, who obviously was the national runner-up last year. You know that. You're at Arkansas, who I am extremely high on this year. You're, then you're, you face Vanderbilt. You're at Tennessee, uh, at Missouri, who, okay, it's, it's Missouri. Uh, Auburn, A&M, at Alabama, home against Ole Miss, and that would wrap up your slate. So that it, it's front-loaded for sure. So it, it might be one of those years where – and a couple really tough series on the road at Arkansas, at Tennessee. I mean, that is that is going to be with Florida, Arkansas, Vandy, and Tennessee all in a row. I mean, you're, you're going to play four top ten teams right there, and then Texas A&M isn't far behind after that weekend against against uh, Missouri and Auburn. They're, they're your, really your – what looks to be potentially maybe your toughest on paper, Alabama's preseason rank too. So the SEC schedule is going to be going to be steep for LSU this year, just because you you know you don't get Georgia out of the uh, East, you don't get Kentucky, you know you you get Tennessee, Vanderbilt, and Florida, arguably the top three teams in that division. Uh, now, granted, two of them are at home, that's massive, but it's still going to be a tough stretch nonetheless. Um, that being said, because I think LSU could make so much hay in their pre-conference slate, you know, I mean, that should get you on the right track towards 20 wins early in the season, or I mean, at least close to it. I'd have to go. I mean, LSU, they lost one game in the pre-conference last year. Um, I don't think the slate is really all that much tougher this season. Just, you know, again, looking at it face value without doing my full schedule preview for next week. Um so, I mean, see, they won, was it 42, 42 games in the regular season last year? Just looking at the conference slate, I think you could expect that to be a little bit lower. I Maybe around, you know, uh, 38 to 40 wins in the regular season, and you go from there in the postseason. I mean, in the SEC, that'll, that'll be good enough to get you, and again, depending on where you make your hay in it, it's that's plenty good enough to get you a, nas- a top, now you know a national seed depending on what your conference record is and and you go into your postseason that way um you know look I mean, we'll just we'll have to see it, it's it's definitely possible that they match you know 41 42 wins whatever they had last season that's for sure uh, a possibility uh as far as postseason expectations i that doesn't change every year i mean lsu it, i mean everyone wants your season to end in omaha and hoisting the trophy um I think it's said often around here the baseline expectation for LSU is a super regional. Like that's the basement. You you have to at least get there. But with everything they have coming back, with where what they've added in the transfer portal, been able to looks like they've been able to rebuild a starting rotation, uh, things of that nature. Uh, Omaha, yes, Omaha is a realistic expectation again for this team. I I think easily. I mean that that's not. That, that you shouldn't shy away from that at all. We talked about it yesterday, how they compared to other defending champions from the past and specifically at LSU. And I think they compare pretty favorably to the 2001 team and the 1997 team. 97 won it. 2001 got eliminated in a super regional. So it's right there where we're talking. And that, that's where this team, that's where this team should be. Uh, moving on here. Another question I got pretty frequently through this. So we'll take them one by one. I know uh, Harley Duce asked it. Hunter T asked it. Uh, is how they, to use Jay Johnson's word, move the ball this year in a sense, right? Do you do we see more stolen bases this year? Do we see more bunts? Do we see more things of that nature? Because you didn't the last two years for good reason. LSU was just hitting the ball over the fence at nauseum. I mean, la- we know last year in uh in excuse me in twenty twenty three they had a hundred and uh. It was 144 home runs, 144 home runs. Uh, so absurd. 
uh, in twenty uh, in twenty twenty two. I can get the number here real fast. They were also over, um, also over a hundred. I think it was one hundred and fourteen. If if memory serves me correct, yeah, one hundred and fourteen. Look at that. Um, so it makes sense that you would ask that, right? And look, I'll tell you right now, LSU is losing sixty percent of the home runs out of their lineup last year. About eighty five of them, um, but. When you look at this team, I don't think the power lacks that much. I, I really don't. And that was one question that I had coming in to this season is would the power be able to just reload, if you will. But, I mean, Tommy White's back, y'all. He hit 24 home runs. He's never he, he's never hit below two. That's his low. He hit 27 as a freshman at NC State at 24 last year. He's, he's going to hit a lot of home runs. Will it be 20 something? I don't know. Again, you're going to have to find someone to protect him in the lineup or whatnot, but Tommy White's going to hit double-digit home runs for you this year, um, provided he stays healthy. Hayden Travinsky had 10 home runs last year, just 104 bats. You give him a full season, he could push 20 for you, and he's looked really good in the you know fall and now through the preseason. That's another guy, double-digit home runs, so you're up to two right there. Josh Pearson hit four home runs last year, but hit eight as a freshman. That's a guy that with a full season, and we've talked about that, we're excited about that, right? With a full season, could easily push double-digit home runs for you. I look at a guy like Paxton Kling. Paxton Kling in just 90 at-bats had four home runs last year, and everyone expects him to take a big jump. That's a guy who conceivably, yes, could hit double-digit home runs for you this year. Jared Jones had 14 as a freshman. Again, got to work on the breaking ball, some pitch recognition stuff, but it stands to reason if he's going to be in there, he's going to get you double-digit home runs. So, I mean, what was that? Is that five guys that we just went through right there that that could? And that's not even taking into a, account a guy like, uh, excuse me, a guy, a guy I'm trying to find him on, a guy like Brady Neal, who in 67 at-bats had three. Can he take that next step and get you eight, maybe 10? Sure. I, I think there's plenty of pop. Mac Bingham had double-digit home runs last year at Arizona. He's here now. Had one on Sunday in the scrimmage. Sure, that guy can. So, I mean, the power is still there. Are they going to hit 144 home runs? Probably not. But can they get to that 114 that they had in 2022 in Jay Johnson's first year? Yeah, I think that's, I think that is conceivable. I really do. So, I don't necessarily know if you see more stolen bases. I will I will tell you, you probably will see a few more just because you, you'll have a guy like Paxton Kling in the lineup who's really fast, who's maybe arguably the fastest player on the team, and you could take advantage of that in some sense. But it, it's going to take some time to see where this lineup develops, what they become, because that it it is it is a big question on this team. It, it's what we've talked about. I think I've mentioned it in every episode so far, right? It's like, I think... They can do this, but can they really come together? How does Jay stack it up? How does what's the best combination that they find? And, and that's when we'll really know if they'll need to play a little bit more, you know, for lack of a better term, small ball, or if they can pound the ball out of the park like they're, you know, accustomed to doing here the last two years. I, again, I think this is a hundred home run club has the potential to be a hundred home run club. But yeah, when you have a guy like Paxton Kling in the lineup who's a little bit more fleet of foot, maybe you do that. But and I'll also say this, y'all. Y'all. LSU was great at manufacturing runs last year. They, they, I mean, said it all year long. I was never worried about them going to Omaha and having to score in that ballpark because if you if you really watched them, they were the most, most versatile lineup in the country. 144 homers. You remember the two-lane game in the regional? They bunted for the first three innings when they had guys on base to get them around and did it. And then later in that region, they hit five home runs against Oregon State. Go back to the South Carolina game in the SEC tournament where you had the, the two-run shot in the first inning in a massive ballpark that's the same dimensions, basically, as, as uh, the Schwab out in Omaha. Home run. Then you you scored like three runs in an inning without the benefit of a hit because you had sack flies and, and some walks and stuff like that. Then you had an inning where you had like four base hits that you scored. They were extremely versatile. I expect them to be able to do that again this year. So uh, it's... It doesn't always have to be steals and bunts. It can be hit and run. It can be sack fly. It can be, you know, things like that. But I I think the blueprint that you ultimately always want is what you had last year. Can they get exactly to that? I don't know. But, I mean, I think they're going to hit plenty of home runs. I think they're going to move the baseball. And when the when it when the situation dictates it, they'll put guys in motion. They'll bunt. I mean, it's, it's, Jay Johnson's going to do whatever it takes offensively to score runs to win the game. That, I mean... 
We've learned that now in two years. It doesn't matter. This is, they're going to adapt to the situation. They're going to know how to do that, and and they're going. But it's just it might take a little bit longer this year for them to find that right combination in the lineup. Will Corwin, excuse me, Will Corwin, uh, offensively, who would you compare Jake Brown to, and where do you think he fits best in the batting order? I think he'll be in the top. I mean, any time I've been out there, he's been in like the two or three hole. So I think I think probably two hole. I think Tommy White's obviously going to start the season as your as your three hole hitter. Um, who he reminds me, could compare him to offensively? Um, I'll tell you who who one of the first players was who, and I look, I mean, maybe this is a good comparison, maybe it's not. It's mainly just like physically and how he was standing in the box and the position that he plays. But he looked like a bigger Jake Fraley to me, a bigger. I mean, Jake Fraley was around like you know, five eleven, six foot. Jake Brown's like six two, maybe pushing six three. He's He's a big, big kid. He, it, he's what they look like, right? Coming in like, that. okay, that kid's 18. Yeah, he's he's going to do well here. Um, so, I mean, like, just from a comparison standpoint, from that sake, I think that, I mean, that was one of the first things that hits from the left side, start his career in, in, in right field like Fraley did. Um, I don't think he's as speedy as Jake Fraley. But, I mean, just, you know, from a appearance standpoint, that was one of the first players that popped into my head. And then, just bigger. So I'll, I'll go with that. I want to see a little bit more of him. Um, I know he had a home run, I think on Monday night in the scrimmage when I was out there on Sunday, he went over. Um, so I want to see a little bit more and it's going to look, y'all, it's going to take a little bit of time. It's a freshman in the, in the sec. So it's, uh, it's not always, um, you know, they're not always going to be Dylan Cruz and Alex Bregman just right off the, right off the bat hitting three fifty three seventy. And I know y'all know that it's just, uh, I want to take a little bit more time before before getting him. It's kind of tying into that LSU guy uh, asks, what two freshman hitters do you see having the biggest impact? Well, I mean, I I think Jake Brown's going to start opening day, so I'm obviously going to go with him. Uh, but I will I will tell you this: I, I tried to sit and think long and hard about this, and all the freshmen that I've seen hit so far in the um, you know, in the fall and the preseason, and I'm I'm inclined to say it might not be that big of an impact from freshmen at the plate this year. And here's why. And it could be. It, I mean, it very well could be. Could you have an injury somewhere and a freshman has to slide in and they just take off, bang? Sure, that can absolutely happen. We've seen it happen. I say that, though, because the guys you had impact freshmen last year didn't play all that much. And now they're going to be asked to take that next step. We know who they are. Paxton Clean. Well, Jared Jones, I mean, Jared Jones had 161 at bats. He he played plenty, but Paxton Kling, Brady Neal, like I could see those guys really taking that next step as a young player and having a massive impact. Not necessarily a freshman, but their first full season of action, if that makes sense. So I would actually, I would actually, if you want to call it a cop out, call it a cop out. Uh, I would actually say Jake Brown because again, I think he's going to be a freshman starting opening day, and then Paxton Kling, even though he's technically a sophomore. Um, and a draft eligible one at that, mind you. This is a big year for him, and I ex- and his at bats have looked really, really good. Even his outs have been loud. The bats have been competitive, and when he's got one, it's it's been a really nice hit. So I uh, I'm I'll go with him. I know that's te- a technicality in a sense, but that's what I'm doing, and it's my show. I can do that, I guess. Um, all right, we have a few more to get to here. Uh, Jeff at J Lee Rhett one. Uh, he's looking ahead to the future here, which I, I don't mind. Um, next season, Connor Griffin is signed. He says, I know he's a draft risk, but what's the likelihood he gets the campus taking NIL into consideration? Um, I'll say this first about Connor Griffin. If that kid gets to campus, he is, he's easily the best prospect they've ever gotten to campus. I know everybody's, you know, talked about Cam Johnson being the highest ranked prospect that she's got to campus this past year and absolutely take that into consideration with a thing like this. Um, Dylan Cruz was fantastic from his freshman year. Connor Griffin, the way so many people have described it is he's like, he's a generational talent out of high school, like a Bryce Harper or a Mike Trout. It's just guys you don't know. I mean, I know Harper ended up in college, but he went to junior college for a year or two. I mean, he, he didn't go to a four-year university. A, a guy like Connor Griffin normally doesn't show up to a four-year university. That being said, I wouldn't totally, you know, poo-poo the idea. Of course, it's possible. You just got Cam Johnson here. 
You got Dylan Cruz here. You got Alex Bregman here. You got Kevin Gosman here. You, I mean, th- things things happen that can change. You know, a, a player's hello. I mean, for Bregman, it was an injury. For Cruz, it was COVID and a slow and you know losing his senior year of high school baseball because of that. And you know, I mean, things things do happen in, in that in that sense. So, I mean, sure. I mean, is the NIL consideration something? I mean. Yes, but he's not going to get offered an NIL. At least I don't think so. An NIL deal in college baseball, at least on a local scale, and even probably on a national scale, that he would get as a signing bonus potentially to go in the draft. But the real question is how important is money to to him and his family? That's not always a a major factor in baseball recruiting, as it it can be in other sports. Um, A... All these kids at this level play travel baseball. Travel baseball is really expensive, y'all. Really, really expensive. I, I'm sure some of you listening are parents, travel ball parents, and you're nodding your head like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a nice bill. So, uh, and not to mention, I mean, all the extra, you I mean, it's like anything when you look at, you know, sports and, and things of that nature. Um, I don't want to, you know, discredit other sports. I'm sure it's, they're really expensive too. But, um, so I'm not going to totally discredit that. Sure, he, there's always a possibility, but I'm not expecting it. I, I just, he's going to be a top, he should be a top five pick. Like he should be a top five pick, maybe even the number one overall pick. Carlos Colazzo, who we talk, when we use a lot of his stuff during our draft previews and stuff, he, he's like one of the lead draft analysts at Baseball America. So covers college prep, like, uh, you know, prospects are all of that. He's very, very good at what he does. Just yesterday, he called um, Connor Griffin, quote, the toolsiest player in the draft. The, there's no better, but he, in his opinion, there's no better player in this year's draft that had college, high school, whatever, that has better tools than Connor Griffin. So that sounds like a, a, a surefire top five, top three, maybe even number one overall pick. That's going to be, what was, what was Paul Skeen's signing bonus at number one last year, like 9.925? And I am like covering that, right? So, and if you get that, you, you go. So we'll, we'll see. But I mean, I, no, of course, I wouldn't totally slam the door on it because things happen. And I'm not, we obviously don't want to wish anything on the kid, right? But circumstances happen. And sure, maybe it, it, maybe it could, but I'm not, um, not totally counting on that uh, and not expecting it either, but with leaving the door cracked slightly. Um, all right, let's see. Bre- <laughs> Bradford, how do you manage your schedule juggling your duties in Baton Rouge and Oxford? Y'all are going to be in hell not be able to make that joke this season because Ole Miss plays the box. Uh, for those of you who don't know, whenever, whenever LSU is at Ole Miss and they have the SC Network Plus broadcast, the color commentator on there, everybody thinks he sounds like me. So I get flooded with messages uh, that whole weekend asking if it's me. And uh, our friend Bradford here is one of the chief. Uh, he likes to keep the bit going on Twitter with it and, and did it there. Well done. Snuck it in there. Well, well done. I actually did not see that. Uh, <laughs> I actually did not see that comment. I'm not the color commentator for Ole Miss Baseball on the SEC Network Plus. That is not me. Let the record show. All right. Uh, a couple, two more. Kevin R., how do you think the catcher position is going to go in 2024? Much like it did last year, Neil for seven or so, then Malazzo. Malazzo continue to make sure, or does he take over catcher full time? Um, I think it's going to be a lot of Brady Neal. I really do. Uh, I mean, Jay's already said, because you got to con- consider Hayden Dravinsky, right? Jay's already said that, uh, you know, Dravinsky's going to get a lot of DH at bats. So I think that's primarily where you see number eight. Um, Brady Neal, when fully healthy, is your most complete catcher. He just is. The bat, the combination of bat and defense, he's he's your most complete when he's fully healthy. They do a great job in these scrimmages and in these, you know, in the preseason periods, not overworking their catchers as well. So they've been able to bring Brady Neal along slowly coming back from that injury. And, excuse me, and I expect him you know, to be pretty, pretty good, much full go uh, opening day. Could you see a, a situation where, yeah, they do what they did last year, uh, 
you know, the seven innings and maybe throw Malazzo in there for late inning defensive replacement. Sure. Uh, when Brady Neal needs a day off, Malazzo, like Alex Malazzo is going to have a spot on this team. He's, he's going to have a role. He's, he's a, he's a really good player and he, he has made those strides offensively. But I think this year you see a lot of Brady Neal, but behind the plate provided he's healthy just be, just because he is, he is your most complete player. You talk about getting guys to campus. If Brady Neal doesn't reclassify, he probably doesn't make it to campus. So, I mean, like, he's just, he's that type of, he's that, and even reclassifying, he was still like a top 40 player. <laughs> like, I mean, he's just, he, so he's he's really good. I think you see a, a lot of him. Again, you'll see Alex Malazzo because he's really good and, and has a spot on this team and, and will contribute and is a veteran leader, great clubhouse guy. That's highly, highly important. All right, the last one I want to get to here uh, came in actually on, uh, on yesterday, it came in uh, yesterday uh, late. Uh, Jake Brown, not that Jake Brown, different Jake Brown, uh, wants to know what what do we imagine the opening day lineup will be. Uh, look, I'm not set on an order that they'll be in, but I'll tell you who I think will be out there on opening day. Um, we kind of went through that in, in one of the earlier episodes, and we're going to go through it again next week when we do our full deep dive offensive preview. But you know, this is this is kind of what I'm what I'm thinking. I think Mac Bingham starts in left field. Paxton Kling starts in center. Jake Brown starts in right. Tommy will be at third. Michael Braswell, I think, will be your shortstop. Josh Pearson will play second base. Jared Jones, I think, will be your opening day first baseman. Although he's, I mean, I know immediate day. I mean, Jake went on the record and said that that's their plan right now. Uh, you want the bat to pick up a, l- a little bit more, but I, I still think. I don't think anyone's done anything in these scrimmages to unseat him necessarily. So I think he'll be there. I think Brady Neal, as we just talked about, will we'll catch. And I think either Thatcher Hurt or Gage Jump starts on the mound. Um, I haven't full like, – for me, I would probably start Thatcher Hurt, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that they start Gage Jump. So that's, that's what I think the opening day lineup is. Again, order where they're all going to hit. We got a little bit more time to figure that one out. Uh, and as we know, that's going to change. I mean, that, that's not going to be – this their opening day lineup – one through nine is not going to be the same on opening day as it will be, you know, in June, whenever their season ends. So we're going to see a lot of fluctuation there, whether it be just, you know, okay, we thought that combo would work or it didn't or, or injuries or things of that nature. There's plenty that can go on during the season. So not, uh, not going to commit to that, but that's the nine people I think that will be out there um, for, for LSU. So there you go, opening day. That concludes the preseason Q&A. We got through all the questions this year. It did take two shows, but we got through all the questions this year. Love it. We'll do another one mid-season, and then we'll obviously do one as they head into the postseason and, and one you know post-postseason when they're actually done. I, I like doing them. They're a lot of fun, and I love the interaction. So we'll definitely keep that going, and, and maybe it can be added even more up with you know with the video, video element and YouTube comments and things of that nature. So appreciate all the questions. Appreciate the interaction. Get over to YouTube. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Muso at the box. Type it in. Hit the subscribe. Hit the bell. You'll get notified every time uh, a video is posted. It's greatly, greatly appreciated. Like and share to your friends as well. Follow me on Twitter at Muso Matthew. Hey, I started a, um, like a, for lack of a better term, a professional Facebook page you can go follow. That's just Matt Muso. Do me a favor, go do that. That's where I post the uh, podcast on Facebook is on, is on that page, uh, instead of my personal page. So although I don't really use my personal page, I don't, I mean, I just, I'm not on Facebook that much personally. Um, but anyway, go go subscribe up to the go follow. I should say that as well. Matt Musso there on Facebook. That'd be greatly appreciated as we try to grow that platform as well. This has been Musso at the Box. We're back tomorrow to wrap up the week. We're going to be a week away from opening day on tomorrow's Musso at the Box. So be here for that.